Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Colonel Nicole Malachowski is here with us, United States Air Force retired and the first female Thunderbirds pilot. Before we get started, just a few notes. Be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. That is where so many events, in addition to tonight's program, can be found, as well as great places to fly, things to do, $100 hamburgers, and of course, the Fly to Win Challenge, which is happening right now and is an ongoing thing with different prizes in different prize periods. All you need to do is have the mobile app, go fly or just go visit any airport you're checked in. You'll get at least one entry into the event. And uh, our current prize is from Tempest Arrow. It's a complete prize pack from this great company with all of these fantastic products for your aircraft and your engine. So be sure to check that out. In addition, you can post uh, questions in our Q&A section here on the show. And um, although we do not ask those questions directly, we'll be able to keep an eye on that. And if we're able to fit them into the program, I'll be sure to do that for you. So without any further ado, uh, when I'd like to start by kind of explaining something. You know, this program, every time that we have to go and uh, create a title and a listing and a graphic for a show, it, uh, it really creates an interesting conundrum with what it is you list for someone. And this show tonight challenged me probably more than anything. When uh, to simply have one line to write and be able to sit there and simply say the first female Thunderbirds pilot simply does not do uh, Colonel Nicole Malkowski's world justice, all of her accomplishments, so many things. When Colonel Malkowski was in middle school, women were prohibited from becoming fighter pilots. Against these odds, she joins us today as a combat veteran who piloted the amazing F-15 East Strike Eagle in multiple war zones. She rose to become a flight commander, an instructor, flight lead, and has more than 2,300 hours in six different Air Force aircraft. She also served as a White House fellow and was the first female pilot with the famous United States Air Force Thunderbirds demonstration team, which of course ended up being the one line that brought you here this evening. I'm going to bring her online now. She is retired now due to medical reasons from 2017 and since that time has transformed her life's work into helping others face similar life challenges. It is my great honor to welcome Colonel Nicole Malkowski. How are you doing? I am doing great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you and welcome to the basement of my house in Colorado. <laughs> well, for a basement, <laughs> let me just start by saying that's one good set you've got behind you. If this is your basement, I can't imagine what the rest is like. Well, thank you very much. What I didn't tell you is that I'm actually in the corner of my kids' playroom surrounded by Legos and dollhouses. So <laughs> That makes it even better. I like that even. <laughs> you know, um, we, we started uh, both Social Flight to support all people and all pilots uh, within general aviation. And then, of course, this show to bring inspirational people together and into everyone's kind of living room or office on a Tuesday evening during some very challenging times. I would, you embody this more than anyone I know, I would love to hear a little bit about your story and how you got started from just being a little girl without maybe any exposure yet to aviation to the cockpit of a Strike Eagle and beyond. Yeah, you know, I actually can remember like the very moment that I decided, you know, I want to be a fighter pilot when I grow up. Um, I was about five years old, give or take, about 1979, so now everybody knows, of course, my age. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my family went to the local air show, a lot like most, you know, families, you know, do when the air show comes to town. And I remember being just mesmerized by the aircraft, but it was the moment that an F-4 Phantom came by. And I remember the F-4 Phantom came right over the runway, extremely low. And my, my whole body, like my chest rumbled, right? I had to cover my ears because it was so loud. And I remember I could smell the jet fuel and, you know, the F-4 had a little bit of that gray smoke, you know, black smoke coming out the back of the engine. And I just started shaking. You know how kids get like super excited, like they can't control myself themselves. Like that was me. And I remember like looking at that and thinking, that's what I'm going to do someday. I'm going to fly the F-4 Phantom. 
And you combine that with the fact that I came from a family where both of my grandfathers had served in the military. So I knew like military service was honorable and noble and good. When you put that together with that F4 Phantom that day, it was done. <laughs> and how old were you at that point? I was about five. Yes, I'm very lucky. And I honestly became maniacally focused on becoming a fighter pilot to the point that I'm just really glad it worked out because I didn't have a backup plan at all. <laughs> So, so how did that evolve? Did you get any exposure to aviation aside from that before you joined the military or what? Take us through that part. Indeed. So I let, you know, family and friends know that this was my goal and my dream. Now, of course, at that young age, I had no idea that it was against congressional law. And I'm not sure that it would have mattered, right, to a little kid who had a big dream. Um, but by telling family and friends, you know, sometimes opportunities would come around. I remember my grandfather's uh, friend had a piper. Uh, and I, I was it a Cherokee, I don't even remember which type of aircraft, but it was a Piper. And I remember we got into it um, when I was probably 10 or 11 years old and he um, let me fly around the pattern with him. And he let me, you know, pretend like I was taking off and all of that good stuff. So a lot of those little things, but one of the biggest things that I think helped keep me focused was um, when I turned 12 years old, I joined the Civil Air Patrol. I am a huge advocate of the Civil Air Patrol, especially their cadet programs, mm -hmm. um, because I was able to focus on aviation, right, and, and learn about the history of aviation. I was learning about teamwork and leadership. I was building the self-confidence I would need, you know, to someday take the controls of an aircraft and go solo. So I give a lot of credit to the Civil Air Patrol for surrounding me with kind of like-minded people, and I think surrounding me with people who believed in my dream as much as I did. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, so from Civil Air Patrol, I guess I don't know how long you want me to go in my life story here, but like I went into high school and I joined Air Force Junior ROTC. Um, and that also, right, was extraordinarily, you know, formative for me in helping keep me focused in those years where I think it's easy for young kids and teenagers to kind of get unfocused. <laughs> so uh, it kept me on track um, during that time in high school. The Civil Air Patrol, the Nevada wing of the Civil Air Patrol, actually afforded me a flying scholarship which mm -hmm. paid for all of my flying lessons through my solo, which I did um, just after my 16th birthday. Stayed focused wow. on becoming a pilot. I knew I needed a college degree. I knew I needed to be commissioned as an officer to become a military pilot. And so I set my sights uh, really young, like in seventh grade on the Air Force Academy. Um, in fact, I remember writing to the Air Force Academy admissions office when I was like 12 or 13. And they wrote back and they're like, yeah, it's a little early right now, but here's all the pamphlets, you know, so you can plan ahead. And then off to the Air Force Academy. And of course, the rest is history. Wow. So now were you always focused? I know you mentioned military service in your family. Was, was the Air Force the target all along when it came to the branches of the military? You know, interestingly, um, both of my grandfathers were actually in the Navy. My father had served in the Army. Um, but I was looking at it very logically, like right? which service has the most pilots and where can I go that has the highest chance of flying military aircraft? Because the actual branch of service wasn't as important as wearing my nation's uniform and serving, right? I could do that in any branch of service. Now the next question is where are my chances highest of being able to actually get a pilot slot and make that happen? So that's where the Air Force came into it. Now, when was it that it became, what, what are you filming me in and our viewers in on when the legislation changed and the rules changed for uh, both the ability to fly versus the ability to fly in combat? How did that fit into yeah. your progression along the way? Yeah, I kind of feel like my life is kind of always like paralleled, right? The changes in the laws and everything. And I tell people, you know, that I am the product of timing, luck, and circumstance. Um, I'm not special by any means. I just was born at the right time in the right country and was afforded these opportunities. You know, I mean, even in 1979, right, when I was at that air show, that was basically the first year, give or take, that they opened up pilot training to the Air Force for women, opened it up to women, right? Wow. And as I was graduating high school and in my first year at the Air Force Academy, so kind of that 1992 to 1993 is when Congress finally lifted the ban on women, fly, women flying as fighter pilots. So I got to be part of that first tranche of women that flew modern fighter aircraft, not because I was better than anybody else, but because I was born at the right time. Wow. And and what was it like in the academy and getting into the academy? That's that is in itself. You could have a whole show just on that accomplishment. <laughs> 
You could. I mean, getting into any military academy is certainly something special. Um, not a lot of people have the opportunity to do that. The application process is quite grueling, uh, I think, especially in comparison to other colleges and universities. Um, but remember, I am someone who can get kind of obsessed and focused. And in seventh grade, I decided I was going to go to the Air Force Academy. So that was my target. You know, and I worked from the target backwards. Um, what are the things that I need to do to make this happen? So participating in things like Civil Air Patrol and Junior ROGC, working hard to make sure that my grades, you know, were good, making sure that I did things like community service, you know, to get in. Um, it's hard for me to even like ever explain that four-year experience. I don't think you can unless you've gone through it. The first year is extraordinarily tiring, extraordinarily difficult. It's a very like a demanding thing on you mentally, uh, especially I was 17 when I went to the Air Force Academy. You know, when you're 17, 18, 19 years old and you're in that constant military environment, it's hard. It takes focus and grit and commitment and a lot of help and support from all the other people, right, that are going through that uh, adventure alongside of you. Um, but like anything else that's difficult, right, it gets easier as it goes along. You become more acclimated. They lighten up on kind of restrictions and stuff. And by the time you're a senior, it starts to feel a little like a normal college. Um, now, this is funny. I actually live in Monument, Colorado. And from my back porch, you can see the Air Force Academy. And in the morning and at night, I can hear Reveille and I can hear Retreat. And I think of those cadets. And I'm just so proud of them. And I'm so excited for them. Um, so the Academy is 100% I recommend it. It's hard. It's totally worth it. And I worked from the target backwards. It helped me get to where I was going. That's amazing. Do you, do you go back there and visit since it's so close? You know what's interesting? I moved here like right before the pandemic started. So it's been a little bit closed down. I'm lucky to say that uh, they do reach out every now and again for the little events and um, my kids are super excited because local families are able to sponsor a cadet. And so um, at some point in the near future, we'll probably put our name in the hat and hopefully they'll pick us and we'll be able to sponsor a cadet. Um, I remember my sponsor family when I was a cadet, uh, the Ross family, Sue and Dave Ross. In fact, they still live here just down the street um, and how they've been a part of my life ever since I was 17 and 18, both of them retired Air Force, both of them pilots, both of them people who mentored me all along my career. Um, they're like second parents to me. Wow. Is it, I've never actually heard of the sponsorship program. That's that's fascinating. It is. I'm excited to get a cadet, but it also makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like there's more families that apply than there are cadets. So like, I'm like nervous. I'm like, gosh, like, what do I have to do to get picked? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Maybe take a picture of this with your backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an extraordinary institution, and it's just an honor and a privilege for anybody that has a chance to go there. And um, I'm very lucky to be an alumni for sure. Wow. Now, where was your first placement coming out? Yeah, my first placement was pilot training, which actually ended up being at Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi. Uh, back then, it was about a 12-month long program, and I flew the T-37 for the first half, which is now only an aircraft on a stick in museums. So I'm definitely, <laughs> definitely old, but I loved, I always tell people I flew the T-37 uh, tweet. That's what it's called, the tweet. I tell yep. them that's like the original tweet before Twitter was even invented, okay? <laughs> And then I went on to fly the T-38 for about the second half of my time there. Um, and then after that, graduated and was able to find my way to the cockpit of an F-15E. We've had uh, a few different show guests who come out of different branches of the military or uh, astronauts, et cetera. The T-38 seems to be what everyone wants to talk about all the time mm. in their training. Well, it's a heck of a lot of fun, right? I mean, it's the first time I mean, the T-37 is a jet, right? You know, yeah. it's, it's a jet. But the first time you take off in a T-38, and, and you're a young lieutenant whose dreams have been probably since you were five, like me, and all of a sudden you light the afterburner and you can feel that kind of kick in the seat as you accelerate down the runway at a speed you've never done before. And I remember thinking to myself that first time, like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> like, I, I'm not sure, like, I'll ever be able to think this fast. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to stay you know, with the jet. I mean, going from flying, I flew a T3 Sling V at the Air Force Academy and gliders, love gliders. We can talk about that too. So gliders and T3, prop aircraft. And then we went to the T37. It's like a evolutionary leap 
when you get into that T38 and you're flying around the pattern and you're like, I don't even know when to put my gear down. Like this is happening way too fast. <laughs> so, um, but it's also fun, right? It's a very agile aircraft. You get to go supersonic for the first time, you know? Um, so these memories, you know, kind of get etched in with the kind of love of that T38. It's also, I believe, pretty unforgiving in the final turn. So you have to really be focused on just uh, the finesse of that final turn. So it teaches you to really feel the aircraft, you know, as opposed to relying on all the gauges and stuff, like you start to really feel in the T-38. That's my opinion. <laughs> Fascinating. Now, uh, w during that time period, is that when people are being selected for different types, whether they're going to be flying, you know, anything from a C-5 Galaxy or, or Orion all the way to, um, you know, the F-15 that you wound up in? Yeah. What? I said helicopters, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, Think about the amazing mission of the helicopter pilots, whether it's combat search and rescue or, you know, medevac, all those amazing things. People forget about that in the Air Force. Um, so the, the selection process nowadays is very different than what I went through. So I'm going to talk about what I went through back in 1997. Um, we had that 12 month long program and everything is graded, right? Your academics, um, your leadership, your daily flights, your simulator flights, uh, your flying tests and flying check ride scores, and all of that is like number crunched and put into like a class ranking. And so six months into this, give or take, we end the T-37 training and they rank everybody. And at that point, we had a chance to do what's called track select. You could either track select towards fighter aircraft, fighter attack, uh, and bombers, or you could track select towards, you know, cargo helicopter type aircraft. So at that point, um, I finished high enough in, in my class to track select to go towards the fighter bomber attack track. And I ended up going over to the T-38. So the people who went to tankers and cargo and helicopters who, who chose to do that went and flew the T-1, which is an extraordinary plane. Um, I ended up in the T-38 for several more months. At the end of that, okay, um, that's where we're again class ranked based on all the crunching of those numbers. And contrary to things I've seen written about me as graduating number one in my class, I did not. <laughs> I have never graduated number one in anything I have ever done. Um, I graduated fourth in my class and there was one F-15E Strike Eagle. So what they do is they put up the list of available fighter aircraft. We had a couple F-16s, a couple F-15Cs. I think there was an A-10, an F-15E. Um, There's a couple of FAPE assignments, which means you stay on to teach in the T-38 and then go to a fighter. There was a B-52. Um, so that kind of list goes up on the screen and they call you up in front of people in class order. Number one guy, what do you want to fly? F-15C. Number two, what do you want to fly? F-16. I'm just sitting there going, please, nobody take the one F-15E. Because what we didn't talk about is my senior year of high school, they retired the F-4 Phantom. I was mortified, right? The F-4 <laughs> was my, my dream plane. But the Air Force replaced it with the F-15E. So naturally, that's what I wanted to do. So I'm watching. There's only three people in front of me. And I'm like, please don't take the F-15E. They didn't. They also all had their own dreams, right, of the F-15C and the F-16. And anyways, I picked the F-15E. And it was an extraordinarily surreal moment because, what was I, 21, 22 years old? Wow. It was a culmination, right, of 17 years of dreaming big that actually like came to fruition in that moment. It was really cool. Oh my God, that's amazing. I did, it, it, t tell me a little bit, the, the E versus the C on the F-15, what's the, yeah. the significance there? Yeah, so the F-15 portion means, right, that the, that kind of basic airframe is essentially the same. The F-15C model is the one that's been around, right, for, for quite a while. It is light gray. Um, it is single seat with one pilot, and its mission is predominantly to do air-to-air, -air, the air-to-air -air dogfighting, you know, the air-to-air, -air, um, you know, defense type stuff. So very much so. And then in the late 90s, right, or early 90s, sorry, late 80s, early 90s, the F-15E was going through testing and coming online as the newest and greatest thing. Um, ways you can tell the difference is it's dark gray. All right. It also has conformal fuel tanks along the outside, which make the, the airframe, I guess, if you will, look a little bit rounded if you're looking at it nose on. It also has two people, right? So we have a pilot in the front seat and a weapons systems officer or a WIZO that sits in the back seat. And the beauty of the F-15E in my mind is that we have two people because we actually are multi-role. We're considered a multi-role 
you know, day night fighter. So we can do both air to air as well as the air to ground mission. So that's kind of a basic level difference between the two planes, both of them extraordinary and both of them great at what they do. There she is. There she is. <laughs> yeah, she's a beauty, huh? Check that out. I always uh -huh. tell people, man, that, that aircraft is, is a beast and she carried my friends and I safely in and out of combat more times than I can count. And I like to remind people that yes, indeed, it's a she. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. That's incredible. So what was it like then joining and getting, uh, w the first time you got to sit in an F-15E? Yeah, you know what surprised me? Um, so ba training for the F-15E takes place at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. It does to this very day. I arrived there in 1998. Um, you know, <laughs> I think you're just so like surprised. I mean, at least me, I was so surprised I was there. When I walked out to the jet for the first time, I could not believe how big it was. I couldn't believe how tall it was. The ladder we had to climb up and when you get in the cockpit, it's like amazing. And, and you're really on the front of the plane and all you have is this canopy in front of you. And of course the HUD that you can see through. And it's like, you feel like you're on the tip of an arrow. And I remember my very first flight, I had an extraordinary uh, instructor, Colonel Quinn, and um, who treated me extraordinarily fairly and amazingly and was wonderful to work with. We went up on that first flight. And again, when you're on the runway and you put that afterburner in, and now it's a whole different level than the T-38, because now you can feel each and every stage of afterburner light and you're just getting thrown forward and you're feeling that thinking, I'm never going to be able to figure this out. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to think this fast. What have I gotten myself into? And we get up airborne. We get out into the airspace where we're just going to do some, you know, basic maneuvering, right? Rolls and turns and whatever. And I remember he took the jet from me. He said, I have the aircraft. And I said, you have the aircraft. Shook the stick. And he says, I want you to pause right now. Look around you. Look out at the wingtips. Look at the missile tail. Look back at those two vertical stabilizers behind you. Look at you. Don't ever forget this moment, you know? And I will, I gotta tell you, man, I'm so grateful that he did that. That he took that nervousness away from me, took the jet away, we were safe, and let me kind of breathe in that moment, right? Um, and when I became an instructor pilot in the F-15E, I always did the same thing on people's first flight. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that makes so much sense too, to give you a moment that you remember for the rest of your life, that resets you, that gets you calm, that puts you in control, and then you get to work. Yep, indeed. <laughs> oh my. So tell me a little bit about going from this to combat assignment. Yeah, so um, I left Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. I was, they called me Average Ellingwood. Ellingwood <laughs> was my maiden name. I was about as average as you could possibly, it was not a joke, they called me Average. Here comes Average Ellingwood. That was me, man, and I was thrilled. <laughs> Right. I just wanted to like stay under the radar, not cause like major problems. <laughs> um, so Average Ellingwood uh, did her first assignment, if you will, at REF Lake and Heath, uh, just outside of Cambridge, England. So here you are, a young lieutenant, right, going to your very first fighter squadron, living overseas. It was like living the dream. Um, and actually, when we showed up to the base, because there was a, a group of us, maybe like five or six from the larger class who all went to that base together. It was really a, a weird uh, welcome because most of the base like was deployed, but we didn't know why. And so we showed up and we're like, hey, we're here, we're ready to fly. And they're like, yeah, there's no planes or instructors. So good luck with that. <laughs> and I remember they had us like painting the Quonset huts. I took out trash. I mean, it, it was like, wait, this isn't like the experience I'm supposed to have, but it, or I had in mind, but it turned out that the wing had deployed for what would eventually become Operation Allied Force. So remember that over Kosovo. So now I'm dating myself. Now it's 1999 and late 98, 99. And um, eventually what ended up happening is they would send instructors back and forth to Lake and Heath to, to fly with us, to do simulators with us, to fly with us so that we didn't atrophy our skills. Mm -hmm. And the really cool part was when all of us graduated, um, we immediately went into combat. And so a lot of people can spend their entire career training for a day that never comes and that's okay and that's honorable and it's good that our country has that readiness um, and then there's a select few right who all of a sudden you know graduate and as lieutenants young people are straight into combat um, we had a section of people who 
immediately were flying you know those missions um, I came in a few months later, right at the end of Allied Force, it became Operation Deliberate Forge. And I'll never forget our squadron deployed uh, to fly out of Aviano Air Base, Italy, in support of Operation Deliberate Forge over Kosovo. And my very first flight was a night flight. And this was when they had just come up with NVGs, night vision goggles for fighter aircraft. And I'll never forget, it was the day of my first night combat mission. They're like, here's some NVGs. I had an hour long class. They put the, the squadron commander in my backseat, a Wizzo by the name of um, Lieutenant Colonel Summonsby, called Sign Junior, an extraordinary leader and pilot, uh, Wizzo, taught me to be a good pilot. Um, so I've got the squadron commander, I'm a lieutenant, right? The squadron commander in your backseat on your first night combat mission wearing MVGs for the first time. It was, it was wild. So there's a good combat memory. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and uh, tell me a little bit about your combat experience in, in Kosovo. Yeah, um, I would have to say my combat experience, and I will just be very transparent, was rather anticlimactic. Um, I have so many friends who found themselves on missions that were just extraordinary. Uh, they did heroic things. Um, I, I'm not one of them. So when I was flying over uh, Kosovo and all of that, Serbia, all, Bosnia, um, a couple of times maybe, you know, I got to be careful what I say. I wasn't doing anything where I was actually employing weapons, okay? Mm -hmm. Fast forward, um, my most distinct combat experiences would be in 2005. At this point, I was a major, uh, no, I was a senior captain, and um, we deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. This was on my second assignment to RAF Lake and Heath. And at this point, I had found myself in a place where I had every single certification and qualification you could have. So I was a two ship flight lead, four ship flight lead, instructor pilot, evaluator pilot working in Stan Aval. I was a mission commander. I was leading peers safely in and out of combat. I was a flight commander. Like this was like, you know, the height of the, the dream, right? And that's where, you know, sometimes things would get a little bit more um, active. Back in 2005, I mean, there was still a lot of that ground war going on, right? You may remember Fallujah and things like that. And one of the missions that the F-15E Strike Eagle um, originally wasn't built for, but grew into and has become extraordinary at, is what we call CAS, C-A-S, Close Air Support. So that's when we would be called in um, to support uh, kinetically, sometimes not, um, troops on the ground, uh, whether they were American or allied, who were under, you know, immediate close attack from the enemy. So those were very high risk missions. Um, those were missions where there was an intense sense of urgency. Um, and those were missions that, you know, you always, you always remember. So, um, yeah, Operation Iraqi Freedom tended to be a little more dynamic for me. Um, but again, I don't ever want to compare myself to my friends who found themselves on missions where extraordinary stuff happened. Um, just not me. <laughs> no, I, I can tell that by your personality. But at the same time, I, I suspect that uh, you, you still did some amazing things, especially in, in leading uh, during all those types of missions. It must have been interesting to, uh, and, and certainly had a lot of adrenaline going on doing some of the things that you did over there. Yeah. There's definite adrenaline, there's focus, there's concentration. Um, and I think it was always extraordinary for me to take a young lieutenant out on their very first combat mission, you know, and having those conversations with them ahead of time about everything that could go right. And of course, everything that could go wrong. Um, I like to tell people, people would always say, you know, Nicole, they pay you fighter pilots, right? You're an elite class, right? They, the American taxpayers, they pay you to be really proficient, right, at employing, because it's not just flying a plane. Remember, it's a weapon system. So we are employing a weapon system. The taxpayers of America pay you to employ that weapon system. And I always correct people. I said, no, that's not what the taxpayers of America, I think, pay fighter pilots for. They pay us for our judgment. Mm, yeah. We do what we do for our judgment, especially when things go wrong. Because I don't know about you, but I have never flown a sortie that went exactly the way I planned it. <laughs> Yeah. And I started it, flying when I was 12. <laughs> I think that's probably true of just about every pilot out there. Your training is for the unexpected and when things don't work. It's pretty, it's, it's a lot easier to do the thing, right? You can solo in a few hours probably, but that doesn't do anything once things start to go bad. Indeed. And, and like I said, we, these aren't just planes that you take off, fly, and land. 
these are giant pieces of flying software and hardware mixed together at 65 million dollars plus each right um so knowing how to use that weapon system and select the different weaponry or armament or arming times all of those things that you need to alleviate the pain point of that soldier sailor marine airman on the ground at the exact time and place that they need it mm. it's, uh, yeah it's intense and it's amazing and i'm just honored i was ever even a part of it so what was it like coming back from uh from deployment and from that active service you know coming back from deployment is uh is always a, an interesting feeling from a combat deployment um because you are in such kind of like a, like a hyper aroused state right of just focus and concentration and you're on a schedule you know where you're 12 hours on 12 hours off for crew rest in that time you know you're still trying to mission plan and get all these things done get the type of rest that you need you know, stay up to date on the latest on what the enemy's doing, whatever it is. My point is, is that the level of focus and concentration and commitment and just intensity, um, when you come back home, it takes time, right, to come off of that. It's like a boxer coming out of the ring, man. I mean, that there's an adrenaline rush um, that's chronic over time, right? That's over the time of your deployment. So coming back, it can take time. And, you know, back in the 90s, I think we would come back and you know, we'd go right straight back to work. But I'm glad to say that the Air Force and the military writ large is doing a much better job about making sure that there are um, dedicated time off from work so that you can decompress. Um, they have uh, things in place to help you decompress, whether that's like a morale, you know, like little events together, whether that's uh, mental health support, whether that's, you know, supporting time and bringing families in so you have time to reconnect. Um, they protect this space now so that you can decompress and get the support you need to kind of re-enter into kind of the normal peacetime training mindset. Got it. Now, did you move on to be commander before or after you, then you uh, were with the Thunderbirds? Yeah, so let me think through this. Uh, after I left the Thunderbirds, so I flew in the 2006-2007 season. For the first part of 2008, I trained my replacement, um, Kirby Enser, who did an amazing job. And from there, I actually went and served in the White House for a year as a White House fellow. So in the military, about the time you become a major, um, they have you do something called IDE. I think it's Intermediate Developmental Education. Don't hold me to that. I'm old now. Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, but it allows you to get out of the cockpit and kind of just broaden your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, for most majors who do IDE, you either do that through an Air Force program at Maxwell Air Force Base. Um, maybe you do it alongside the Army or the Navy schools for a little bit of a joint you know, crossover. But some people get really lucky. And there's these fun fellowships and things like that. And the White House Fellowship was one of them. Um, so to this I want to pause you I here no because idea how I, got picked. <laughs> I, I want to make sure we don't skip over the Thunderbirds part before yeah. we get through this. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Well, so you asked about command, though, but command hasn't come yet. <laughs> oh, geez. I'm sorry. So no, no. take me first to the Thunderbirds okay. and through that, and then I want to get to command. Okay, so the Thunderbirds. Um, I guess I should tell people now that I'm actually from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, obviously I was too short to be a showgirl, so I stayed focused on becoming a fighter pilot. And it's home to Nellis Air Force Base, which a lot of people watching now probably know is known as home of the fighter pilot. So I grew up watching that F-4 Phantom, right? I grew up watching these fighter aircraft. And Nellis Air Force Base is also home of the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. So when I was in high school, it wasn't uncommon, right, for me to take my brown, you know, bag lunch out onto the football field, eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and watch the Thunderbirds scream overhead. And I remember thinking, like, I want to do that someday. But I knew that that was hard, right? I mean, I had to become a fighter pilot first, right? And then you have to become an experienced fighter pilot, which takes time and effort. And then you have to go through this amazingly detailed, if you will, Thunderbird application process. So there I was back in 2005 in Iraq. I told you I finally had the qualifications and the hours and the things I needed to meet uh, the requirements to apply to be an Air Force Thunderbird. And so I applied right before we deployed. When I'm down in Iraq, I get an email that says, you made the semifinals. It's kind of a two-part process, the semifinals and the finals. And I was 
I didn't know what to do because they're not going to let you fly back to the United States in the middle of a combat deployment, right? Where they need each and every body out there flying the real world missions. So I remember thinking, well, huh, I actually got picked out of all the applicants to do the semifinal interview, but I can't go. And I ended up talking to my squadron commander, a guy by the name of Dan Debris. His call sign's Trash. Trash Debris, okay? <laughs> so, great man, fully supportive. He says, let's not give up on this. Let's see if we can find a way. And so he put himself out there uh, in support of me. And he went to his chain of command in Iraq. And he said, look, I really think she has a chance. And I think that we as an Air Force and as a squadron need to support her in this. And I will work the flying schedule to make sure that we get these missions done. And I couldn't believe it. He came back, he's like, you're on a plane tomorrow. Please make us proud, please make this worth it. And that was huge. I don't know if you guys can fully appreciate, I'm sure the veterans can, but like, get sent home. And I had mixed feelings, but I gotta tell you, the brothers in my squadron were so excited and so supportive of me that I felt like I was representing them. And that's what Thunderbirds really do, right? your whole job is to represent all of the other people in the Air Force, right? With the dignity and the respect and the honor they deserve. And like in that moment, they were cheering me on. And so I flew home and I did the semifinals. And then while I was still in the US, I found out I made the finals. So I stayed for the finals. Um, we can talk a little bit about what those are. I ended up two weeks, three weeks later, flying back to Iraq and flying combat sorties. Oh so I went God. from combat to interviewing for the Thunderbirds, back to combat. All right. And then found myself redeploying back home. So if not, like when I said earlier that I am a product of timing, luck and circumstance, I am. Think about all of the people who made that happen. You know, I will always be in debt to Dan Debris for that um, support and to my colleagues and peers who picked up my slack while I was gone. So that is amazing. The semifinals. Yeah, the that semifinals. Go ahead. Yeah. So tell me the process. What's in, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so first of all, it's a big application, right? You got to turn in all of your annual performance reports, your HR personnel stuff, all of your flying check ride and flying test scores, which to that point had always gone good, except I failed one in pilot training. We can talk about that too. <laughs> I, I didn't have my flaps in the right position, so I, I had to do that to check ride again. Anyways, um, you have to have like a letter of why you want to be a Thunderbird, a whole bunch of letters of recommendation. Um, a lot of people around the Air Force are qualified and they apply. The team reads those, makes the cut, invites out about 12 people, give or take, for the semifinals. Uh, at that point, you meet the team on the road at one of their deployed air shows. Um, and in that case, it's really, you do do some informal interviews. They're more checking out your personality. Um, it's more you getting to know the team. It's a very unique squadron, the way that it's set up, the processes that it follows, because it's a very unique mission. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think the semifinals is more for the applicants to go, do I really want to do this? Because it is not an easy lifestyle, period. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get picked for the finals, that's where you meet them at Nellis Air Force Base and things get a lot more formal. So now you're in service dress, right? Which my husband had to ship from Lake and Heath, FedEx, because <laughs> I'm flying in my desert flight suit from Iraq to, to make this. But anyways, um, formal interviews with the commanders, with the team, um, and then with the decision makers, right, which are the general officers um, that were there. General officers that, um, again, time and luck and circumstance put them in a place to say, yeah, right, we're ready to have a woman Thunderbird pilot, and they were willing to make that, you know, decision. Um, General Goldfein uh, being one person who's very, you know, special and important to me. And at that time, the commander of Air Combat Command, General Ron Keyes, um, who are still in my life to this day, and I appreciate their mentoring. So you do that. They sent me back to Iraq. We re redeployed to Lake and Heath, where they gave us two weeks off, right? We just talked about that. My husband took me on a cruise of the Baltic Sea. So there we are, a week into the cruise. It's the middle of summer. We are in um, Oslo, Norway. We're docked in Oslo, Norway, and it's about 11 o'clock at night, and it's bright sunshine because it's Europe in the summer at 11 o'clock at night, and the phone rings in the, in the stateroom. Immediately, both my husband and I, heart sinks because as most military service members and veterans know, when you're on leave and the phone rings, that's usually not a good sign. And as a flight commander, my instinct was that someone in my flight or that I was responsible for had gotten 
hurt or that there had been an accident. So we answer the phone, my husband does, because I didn't want to touch the phone. He answered it and the guy said, uh, stand by for the commander of Air Combat Command, General Keyes. And he hands the phone to me and I'm waiting and there's a, a Lieutenant Colonel online. This is Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so, stand by for the commander of Air Combat Command. And he, I know, is the one who makes the final decision on who is selected or not. And in that moment, I just knew that this was my consolation call because it's tradition that they call everyone. Um, in the finals, there's only about six people. So the, they give the courtesy of calling all six pilots, even though three are going to get picked. And so I knew this was my consolation call. And I, he said, is this, is this Fifi, which is my call sign? I said, yeah. He said, Ron Key's here. I'm like, yes, sir. You know, he's a four-star general. I'm just a captain. I'm kind of nervous and shaking at this point. Luckily, he couldn't see it. And he said, uh, we have a pretty great Air Force that I could find you in the middle of the Oslo Fjord, don't we? And I said, yes, sir, indeed we do. And he said, I'd like to offer you a job. And that, my friends, is how it went. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is amazing. <laughs> that was a I long can't... story to your short question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, please, don't apologize for that. That was, that must have been one of the seminal moments of your life. Indeed, it was extraordinary. And I remember holding the phone. He said, we'd like you to be Thunderbird number three right wing, you know, do you accept? And it's such an intense assignment that they want people to really be on board. And I, I'm looking at my husband going, you know, I got the job, I got the job. And I'm like jumping up and down, but I'm trying to be cool. You know, you always gotta sound cool on the radio, right? Right, you don't key the mic until you're ready to sound cool. So I'm like, oh yes sir, that'd be great. You know, and hung up the phone and my husband ordered a bottle of champagne and we sat out on the deck and watched the yacht race go by at midnight. And, you know, that was that. It was uh, wow. wonderful to be able to experience that with my husband, um, who, of course, is like my biggest cheerleader and champion even to this day. So without him, I couldn't have gone through that or even endured the scrutiny that came with it, which I guess we can get to as well. <laughs> yeah, well, and 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 again, he was in was again in the Air Force as well. Was a Wizzo, you said. Yep, we met flying the F-15E together in 1999, uh, flying missions over Kosovo. Wow, wow. Yeah. So tell me about your time with the Thunderbirds. So the time with the Thunderbirds is uh, is busy. It's whirlwind. It's a deep honor. It's a deep privilege. Um, it's an extraordinary squadron, and I just want people to know there are 125 people from 25 different career fields that come together to make that mission happen. And it's very easy for audience members or people to see the six jets and think of the six pilots, but we fly hard for 30 minutes during the air show, which we do, but like for 23 hours and 30 minutes out of the day, it's 125 of like the finest enlisted people from 25 different functions that make it happen. I have never been amongst a group of more professional, detail-oriented, kind, um, sense of urgency always type people. I mean, it's just, it's a special place. It's a special squadron full of really special people. Um, training season was four months long. We have a training syllabus that's crawl to walk to run. Some maneuvers clicked, some maneuvers did not. Uh, I never really enjoyed flying in the trail formation where we're stacked. Uh, I'm third down from the top. That's a, a higher risk formation to fly in. Um, all of us had kind of those maneuvers that, you know, tested us. Um, and, and it's hard because you're like, man, I'm the hometown girl done good. I, I'm here as a Thunderbird. I, I'm an experienced F-15E pilot and I'm struggling, right? And, and it's a, training season is a very humbling uh, at least it was for me, very humbling experience. Um, and we're flying twice a day, sometimes three times a day. A couple times we flew on the weekend just to keep up um, because you have a set graduation date, you know, to make the air shows. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, you know, what training season is like. And then when you hit the road, the next two years is just like, it's like a fire hose, right? Because you're on the road five days a week, eight, nine months out of the year. Uh, nine months, maybe even 10. I'd have to do the math. It's been a while, but it's, it's intense, right? I mean, you, uh, you leave every Thursday, you leave and fly to a site on Friday, you're at the air show site and you practice. That's also the days we do like different community service, interact with communities and schools or the make a wish, you know, foundation, whatever that is. 
Um, on Saturdays, you'll do uh, community type events and recruiting booths in the morning. Then you'll go fly the air show. Then you'll go to a reception that night. These are long days. On Sunday, you'll rinse and repeat. Um, on Monday, you'll fly home. On Tuesday, you will um, practice at home at Nellis. On Wednesdays, you relax, you unpack your suitcase, you wash your clothes, and you repack them uh, for Thursday. And a lot of us were also working on other things. Uh, the two years I was on the Thunderbirds, I was getting my master's degree. Oh, my God. Uh, so my crew chiefs, uh, my first year, Dave Batterson and Nate Pigza, they have my heart forever. Um, they would carry my books for me because I couldn't fit them you know, in the F-16. And so after the air show and the reception, I would go to my room and stay up till, oh, well, you know, I was, don't, don't, don't worry. I still had crew rest, but I would stay up and I would work on my master's degree. Oh so, my goodness. <laughs> now you didn't mention, uh, I mean, as, as the whole interview process and then getting into that, you don't actually fly as part of that from what you've described. Are they, not, they're not evaluating you in the air? Yeah, gosh, I forgot the, that's, thank you, right? I mean, that, that's how old I'm getting. So when you make it to the finals, right, that final five or six people, they do, you're at Nellis Air Force Base, they do take you on a flight. But part of it is to assess your flying. The other part of it is really as a, you know, like a congratulations, man. You're here, you made it this far, no matter if you get picked or not. Enjoy a flight in a red, white, and blue F-16 in formation, right? I mean, like, it, I remember going up on the flight, and of all the six people who made it to the finals, I was the only one who wasn't an F-16 pilot by trade. Wow, and, that's yeah. huge. So they put me in, we have, a, the, the Thunderbirds have two F-16D models uh, at the time, which were two-seaters. So they put me in the back seat of the Thunderbird 2 at the time, a guy by the name of Scotty Zamzo, also a great guy. Um, he was also a Strike Eagle pilot by trade. So he was rooting for me, you know, and he flew in the front seat. I flew in the back. We took off. We got the gear up and he goes, your aircraft. And the very first thing I did is instinctually I reached for center stick because that's where the strike eagle stick is. Well, and the F-16, it, it's a side stick. So I make this kind of, whoa, I'm not cool. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like muscle memory. And instantaneously I started over controlling because it was fly by wire, right? Which is very different than the F-15E, which is some fly by wire, but also some hydraulic. So it's just very much more sensitive in the F-16. So I immediately started flying like this and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, right? And Scotty tells me, you've got about three minutes till we get to the airspace. So just relax, try to feel the airplane. And then I realized, right? Every airplane's the same. Even, every, you know, your Cessnas, your T-51 you got behind you, right? Like, Faster, slower, climb, descend. Okay, right? I got this. And um, they got us in formation. I flew on the wing of Thunderbird 1. We tried loops. We tried rolls. I was all over the place. I was like, well, this ain't going to work out for me. I'm doing the best I can, but I'm nowhere near, you know, the position I'm supposed to be in. But then again, nobody is the first time that they try that. Um, so, yeah, I did get to fly, uh, to fly during the finals. And... Um, that's what it went like. And I just remember, again, doing what I did on that first F-15E flight, looking around. I mean, looking out, and that is a red, white, and blue painted wing out there. Right? <laughs> I, can, I can turn this switch and smoke comes on and back. Like, <laughs> I don't care if I get picked. The fact that I got to do this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So it was, while I was nervous, there was also a lot of joy and a lot of excitement. Wow, that's amazing. And I didn't even realize that that was basically the first time that you transitioned uh, over to the uh, F-16. Yeah, I, I'm not lying. He's like, you have the aircraft. And I'm like, whoa. I'm not, I, I was, I, the only one that knew was me, but I was embarrassed. I was like, oh my God, side stick. Okay. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. It's unbelievable. Um, so I want to get back to where you were going before, too, especially uh, in the little time we have left, because there's so, so much more, of course, than this. And tell me about becoming a White House fellow. Sure. So um, I told you I was working on my master's degree while I was a Thunderbird, because that was a requirement in order to apply to be a White House fellow. And it was something I wanted to do. I didn't want to do just the normal um, education program. I, I knew I could do that. I might as well put my hat in the ring and see if I could get picked for something fun. Um, and so that's an even more intense application and interview process, trust me. Um, anybody out there that's interested in the White House Fellowship, 
by all means, you know, feel free to reach out on, uh, on social media. I actually just this year uh, was appointed by President Biden uh, as a commissioner um, on the White House Fellows Program. So it's actually something I do and I'm happy to recruit uh, all of the best and the brightest out there. But I put in that application, I went through two rounds of interviews, regionals, which was like semifinals, and then nationals, which was like finals. And somehow, I have no idea. I got picked. And I'm amongst this group of just extraordinary Americans, right? I've got people who are teachers and lawyers and doctors and researchers and, you know, major finance geniuses. And, and then there's, you know, a, a couple other military people, extraordinary Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, um, and then, you know, me, right? I feel like Forrest Gump sometime. Like, I just kind of find myself like, oh, how'd I end up in this cool, you know, position? Uh, but I got picked during the last six months of the Bush administration. So I worked for President Bush. Specifically, I was assigned to what's called the Office of the President-Elect, um, which is the office that the incoming president uses um, between election and inauguration day. So I got to see that peaceful transition of power of the most powerful office in the world. And I say peaceful transition of power up close and personal. So six months under George Bush, I would go in and meet with him and his staff. They would tell us what they wanted the incoming Obama team to know, right? And then we would go over to the office of president-elect and welcome the Obama team in. So here I am, a major in the Air Force, who has absolutely no business, no business, <laughs> doing what I was doing, but there I was. And so I spent a year um, working under those two uh, administrations and learning about the federal government, not just the challenges that they face, but the opportunities um, that are out there to help America, the way that national policy, you know, the, how the sausage is made. Um, I got to learn all of that. And I think most importantly, I gained a network of these other fellows who gave me a really different perspective on what leadership and teamwork and innovation looked like outside of this military frame that I had been in since I was 17. So to be able to, to this day, I just talked to one of my fellow fellows yesterday, reach out to them and go, here's a problem or a challenge I have, how would you solve it? And to have them come back with something that's totally different than the way my military mind works, I think that's the greatest gift of the fellowship. Wow, wow, that's amazing. And you did a project there for the WASPs, is that correct, during that time? Yes. So as I mentioned, I felt like Forrest Gump. I find myself in this extraordinary time in history. I'm a White House fellow, um, which allowed me to open doors and get meetings with people that I had no business having meetings with. But because I was a fellow and because I had certain security clearances, et cetera, it opened a lot of opportunities. And I thought, well, I have one year to do something big. I have one year to try to do something gnarly. What would that be? And my whole career had been aligned right, with my heroes since I was 12 when I learned about them, the Women Air Force Service Pilots or the WASP of World War II. Now these were America's first women military aviators. The fact is that they blazed the trail that I was able to follow. I and generations of military pilots, women and men alike, owe them, right, a debt of gratitude. And for those who know the WASP story, know that towards the end of World War II, they were unceremoniously disbanded, their records were stamped secret, put away in the archives, never to be shared in American history books, and they were denied veteran status, et cetera. And I could, we could come back and have an entire hour on that. But I thought to myself, I have a year here to do something as a White House fellow. I want to correct the record. How do you correct the record of the WASP? How do you get their story of service and sacrifice and patriotism and skill as pilots out into the history books? And then I was like, well, I don't know, maybe like a congressional gold medal. So I went about studying uh, the congressional gold medal. I went over to the National Archives. I read where the Tuskegee Airmen had wonderfully and rightfully been awarded the congressional gold medal, started calling people, and I thought, we're going to do this. And so my idea grew into a team of, a core team of about six people, and we committed that we were going to get the congressional gold medal. People laughed. They said, you're already three months into a 12 month long program. It's not going to happen. It did happen. Um, I drafted Senate Bill 614 on the fourth floor of my condo in Alexandria, Virginia. And with this core team, uh, we were able to get around Capitol Hill. I was able to get meetings with people that I shouldn't have ever had access to, but I did. 
And it's a compelling story. And I think people, the senators and the representatives were on board because it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And because of their impact of the WASP and because, uh, like I said, we needed to correct the record. So it ended up, of course, that um, in that 12 month period, I managed to get that bill to become law. And then it took another few months for us to get the ceremony on Capitol Hill in 2010. So at that time, I was told it was the fastest bill to law in history. And at that time, it was the largest ceremony ever held on Capitol Hill. And the point wasn't to like any wasp, if you've had a privilege of meeting one, and unfortunately there's just not a lot of these heroes left, but every time I talked to them, they didn't care about awards or recognition. This had nothing, it's a medal, yeah, but that has nothing to do with it. It was about correcting the record and making sure their story was told. And that me and this core team um, were able to gain the momentum that we needed and the support from our representatives as well as the American public. I don't know, it's probably the coolest thing I've ever been a part of in my life outside of probably birthing my twins. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's truly amazing. Um, and, and I would like to see if we could have you uh, back to talk about that because I think that the wasps and their story and, and the work that you did to, to bring some of that to light and to get them the recognition, the ability to be buried in uh, Arlington is so, so, so important. There's, a, there's so much more to talk about. There is, and to be clear, I wasn't the one responsible for the, the law that changed that allowed them to be buried at Arlington. That is my friend, Erin Miller, and you should have us both on because uh, she's a hoot and a, just, a, just a powerhouse. We will definitely, definitely do that. Now, before we are out of time, I also want to transition to um, really what happened medically f for you and, 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 and some of the, the work that you're doing now, because really that seems to be the focus, the current focus of your life and, mm -hmm. and such an amazing impact in what you've transitioned to so many other people. Yeah, I never thought I'd find myself in the place uh, that I am now, um, long story medium. Um, you know, three and a half years ago, I was medically retired from the military. My career was going great. Um, I wanted to still fly. I wanted to still lead airmen, but I got sick. Uh, I ended up finding myself in a place where I had a brain infection that made it so I couldn't walk, talk, read, or write. Um, I was a bit of a medical mystery for quite some time, which was very frustrating. I became completely dependent on other people for my daily, you know, activities of living, right? Uh, my husband became my caregiver. The military said, we don't know what to do with you. you know, we're going to have to medically retire you. Um, you know, spoiler alert, uh, I'm a survivor of late stage neurological tick born illness. Yeah, a tick. So an itty bitty tick completely broke this fighter pilot, right? I was physically fit, mentally fit, spiritually fit, and boom, I got sick to the point that um, I had moments of temporary paralysis where I couldn't even speak or walk. And uh, they sent me to some civilian doctors up in Boston who informed me that there had been damage done to my brainstem and that my treatment would take about two years and that I would never be 100%. And that was a really hard pill to swallow and that I would never fly again. I mean, I didn't even know my last flight in the F-15E was my last flight. Like, I wish I could go back and know that that was my last flight. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in that moment, it's really just about survival. So I spent nine months bedridden, unable to walk, talk, read, and write. I did another year in rehab, uh, learning to walk, talk, read, and write, so I can be here with you uh, to this day. During that time, I was rightfully medically retired. And overnight, right, I lost my identity. Like, who am I if I'm not wearing my nation's uniform that I've been wearing since I was 17? You know, what is my contribution to society if I'm not flying combat aircraft and leading airmen? You know, how am I going to provide? for my family. And I got into a really, you know, low, low kind of place. And then one day I was laying in bed and laying on the couch because I was basically bedridden and housebound for two years. And I remember thinking to myself, these words, yield to overcome. Uh, yield to overcome is what came to my mind. And you're thinking like, why would those three words come to your mind? Well, I don't know, divine intervention, the universe. But I realized that I had to let go of the past and the old me because she didn't exist anymore. And it mm -hmm. wasn't about what I couldn't do. What I had to do was change my mindset and go, what is it that you can do now with what you have right now, you know, moving forward? And, 
you know, for any fighter pilots that might be watching or other pilots that are out there, or even the ones that fly the dogfight simulators, you know, when you're in a high aspect dogfight, right here at this point of merge, you don't want to pull too hard. In order to win, you have to yield to regain airspeed to come back around. And it was like this fighter pilot mentality is what allowed me to survive my illness and transition to what I do now, which is a national level patient advocate. And frankly, I like to say I give voice to the voiceless. And I mean that literally. Mm. Um, there are people out there suffering from tick-borne illness that are misdiagnosed, undiagnosed, not getting the treatment and support that they need. And I try to help walk them um, through that. And in fact, I could argue that I impact more people now more positively, more quickly than if I had ever stayed in the Air Force. And so where I thought my whole life and legacy was being the pilot, right? Being the fighter pilot, I realize now that that was never the end of my journey or my destination. Being a fighter pilot and a pilot like all of you, like it gave me the skills and the characteristics and the traits that I needed to make it through that transition and to thrive in what I do now, which is professional motivational speaking and leadership consulting. So that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> Oh my, I mean, that is, that's just amazing. And, and everything about your story from five years old forward, as, as much as it, I can imagine that it could seem like, like a path that then takes the wrong turn at the end or has something just adds up. It just makes sense. Those are all the skills. Those are all the things that you can bring to bear to help so many people in the ways that you're doing it right now. And so I think an awful lot of people have a, a, a great amount of appreciation for the work that you're doing now and that you continue to do into the future. Thank you. And, you know, people say a lot like, Nicole, I'm sorry you can't fly anymore. And for the people watching, I know you know this, but I, uh, I have major dysautonomia, which means I can't control my heart rate, blood pressure, or temperature because there was damage to my brainstem. I also have um, a difficulty reading and writing. And I have difficulty prioritizing or, you know, task managing, which kind of would be a bad thing in a plane. And I also have a balance deficit now. Um, and so I can get dizzy and vertigo really quick. So for all of those reasons, I can't fly plane anymore. But I have a lot to be grateful for. I have, I mean, I did it right. You know what I mean? I look back mm. on my flying career and even though that's not my profession now, I'm still a pilot in my heart. I always will be. It's what shaped me and made me who I am, you know, to this day. So even though I've lost the ability to pilot my own aircraft, um, I'm kind of piloting my life in a different way. It's it's amazing and, and it is is unbelievably inspirational. And and just thank you so much for everything that you've done for the service to the country formally and for the service to the country that you're doing now directly informally yourself it, it, or formally, but not, not with the stars and bars attached. Um, it's amazing. I really do appreciate it. And I would love to have you back to talk about the WASP story, to talk about the inspirational side, and what that means to the next generation of women coming into aviation in all facets. Indeed. Hey, that sounds like fun. You know you know where to find me, right? I'm in the basement <laughs> of my kid's playroom in Colorado. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us tonight here on Social Flight Live. Thank you, and I wish the very best and happiest of holidays and Happy New Year to everybody watching. <laughs> Thanks. And to everyone else out there, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live for another wonderful presentation from Colonel Nicole Malakowski. I would encourage you to uh, look her up to uh, do some more research on all of the wonderful things that she does. And to join us again next week, we will be back Tuesday, December 21st. It's, it's something that we do every single year. We are here with the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, that uh, is going to be talking about on the fun side, their Santa tracker, but on a very serious side, they give us quite a bit of information about what the past year has been in the defense of the United States and along the borders and what's happened, uh, happening that uh, you may not uh, be hearing uh, in regular news, but we get it straight from the source from NORAD. On Tuesday, December 28th, Andrew Barker, the founder of TrueTrack, who is a wonderful and another inspirational and fun individual, will be joining us here for that show. And then on January 4th, we kick into the new year with Richard McSpadden of AOPA's Air Safety Institute talking about the year in review. Until next time, thank you all for joining us here on Social Flight Live.
And I wish you all blue skies. Thank you.